Welcome back, listeners, to another episode of Susan Lopresti Wellness, Mind, Body, and Soul, the podcast where we explore the highs, the lows, and everything in between when it comes to a woman's life, her health, and all aspects of navigating the midlife landscape. I'm your host, Susan Lopresti, and today I'm diving into a topic that affects families everywhere how to cultivate a healthy relationship with food for our children and our grandchildren. Now, many of my friends at this point are becoming grandparents for the first time, and many of them are becoming full-time caregivers to their grandchildren while the parents of these children go off to work. So this particular episode is for a young parent and the grandparents to learn the tools necessary for their young ones to have a healthy relationship with food. No longer are the days of using food as a reward or a punishment. We're going to hear a better way of encouraging kids to eat and have a healthy relationship with food. When you hear just how simple it can be, you'll wonder why you never thought of it. So this episode is for anyone who's a caregiver to a young child, be it a parent, a grandparent, or a guardian of young children. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Erica Molodar is a nurse. She's a certified health coach. She's also an aromatherapist and a wellness advocate with over a decade of experience in the health and wellness industry. Erica is the founder of Healthy Wellness, a health coaching service that empowers adults to develop and create fulfilling wellness lifestyles for themselves and also for their families. Erica specializes in helping clients with nutrition, fitness, and mental well being. And she has helped countless individuals making lasting positive changes in their lives. With a background in pediatric nursing, Reiki, and aromatherapy, and a passion for empowering others. Erica brings a wealth of knowledge and a genuine love for helping families live happy and healthy lives. When she's not working with clients, Erica enjoys experimenting with healthy recipes, exploring nature, staying active, and most importantly, spending quality time with her family. You can find Erica on Instagram, And I'll put all the links in the show notes as well, so you don't even have to write them down. One area of specialty that caught my eye with Erica is that she specializes in guiding parents and grandparents to nurture healthy eating habits in the next generation. We'll explore strategies to teach children the importance of balanced nutrition and how to use positive reinforcement without relying on food or treats as rewards. This episode is packed with valuable insights to help you foster lifelong healthy habits for the little ones in your life. So without further ado, Erica, thank you so much for spending time with me here and to um, bring this wonderful episode to my listeners. Thank you again for being here. I'm super excited to be here, Susan. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. So Erica, let's get started. Tell me why you chose this particular area of specialization of health coaching. Yeah, of course. I can dive right into that. So as you said, I was a pediatric nurse to start. So my first love in the healthcare field really was already to help these young kids and more importantly, parents. I think as a pediatric nurse, um, one of the main things that I loved doing was kind of sitting down and talking to parents, teaching them about their kid's diagnosis, teaching about how to support at home or different ways to make sure that they don't end up back in the hospital. So really trying to take that one-on-one time with those parents and it seemed to be make the most difference and it made me the happiest. So it was the first start of my career of knowing that 
some sort of work with families, especially young children was kind of where I wanted to go. My current career path kind of took me a little bit to the preventative side of medicine. So I no longer work in patient care, but um, doing more of preventative medicine through health coaching and through functional medicine. So my coaching technique really is looking at belief systems. So peeling back layers to discover why are we think the way we do, why we act the way we do. And through those belief systems and changing them to be better or kind of unraveling them to no longer believe them if they don't serve you, you can kind of create a health and wellness lifestyle that you actually want and the way that you want to kind of serve the rest of your life. So it really, to me, is setting up that next generation because the way that mother, grandmother, grandfather, dad, the guardian itself can really, you know, best serve their children is actually to really discover the underneath behind them uh, because everything that they do will then impact their child. Right, right. Interesting. I think it's great. I I really do. Talk about how the adult's behavior becomes a mirror that the child picks up on and then mirrors back. Yeah, of course. So that's actually such an interesting part that I think a lot of people know, but don't really quite understand how that can work in real life. So what I mean by a mirror is that a kid's subconscious and conscious mind really will take on everything that they're seeing, everything that you're doing and everyone else that they're surrounded by. So they're taking up these like little lessons, let's say, throughout mm-hmm. life. And those will kind of be the building blocks for them as an adult. So I don't know if you've ever heard someone say like, oh, you're acting like your dad or like, that's the way that your mom would say that. Yeah. And <laughs> that really is because the kid is a, is a mirror. So the behavior or that action that, that you are commenting on is what um, the parent is showing or what the parent is mirroring. So an example would be, you know, you grow up feeling if like I grew up and your mom is very active. She goes to the gym and she talks about how, you know, moving her body makes her feel really good. And she brings you along when it's appropriate or brings you out for walks and really like shows you like the beauty of moving your body and kind of is very positive mm-hmm. towards that. Um, you naturally as a child will grow up to feel the same way or, you know, have the same belief systems early on before your adulthood really sets in of like, you know, I also like to move my body. This feels good. And that's kind of your norm because that's what your mom did. Another way that it could go is that, you know, I think the challenge with society, especially when I grew up was a lot around weight and shaming. So if someone that a child sees quite often has some negative or positive connotations around weight, a child will naturally kind of pick that up and believe it as a system and either, you know, try and fulfill what that belief system is in the way that they think is best. Mm -hmm. So it could be, you know, making sure that they're a certain body type or not eating certain foods because the way that the language is used around them. So kids will always kind of spit back what it is that you're showing them. So what I really focus on with adults is kind of, as I said, kind of peeling back those layers on your own belief system and the way that you talk and the way that you feel about health, wellness, mental well-being, because those those belief systems that are serving you are also what's going to be serving your children. So if there are things that you might not agree with anymore or might be a little bit outdated, it's really important to do the work for yourself because that will ultimately solve it for your child or help solve it. Right. What are some of the tools and strategies that you utilize to help children eat a healthy diet? And this has to be difficult because I was thinking about this when I was reviewing our first meeting. And that is that children are so bombarded by commercials on TV and all of these snacks and goodies and treats. How does a parent today find that balance and teach their children moderation or (laughs) it's really difficult. I, it's super difficult. And, you know, I think unfortunately our system and the way that we process food here in the States doesn't really always set us up for that best success. Um, I think there's a lot of lobbying going around in the different types of foods that might not necessarily be great for us. So it's, it is, as I said, as you mentioned, really difficult to kind of navigate that, especially when children go to school and around peers and people that parents don't necessarily have 
control over. Mm -hmm. So I definitely understand that that is a super challenging, especially for my clients and especially for parents that I've talked to just ad hoc. Uh, But to kind of like dive into it a bit, you know, I think obviously being in the wellness field, you know, and I know that a healthy lifestyle is something that we want for ourselves, for our family and for our children. And the thing that I always come back to when I first explain a lot of healthy lifestyles to parents is to think about what is nature telling us? So children, like naturally our, their brain chemistry will crave sugar. And the reason that is, is because they're growing bodies, they're growing their brains. And so what the body wants is this fast, quick energy. And most of the time that comes from sugar or very simple carbs. And so it's not to say that children can't have any of that because obviously they need their brain to grow. And there, as you said, there are kind of things out there on the online and commercials in the grocery store. So it's really trying to find that balance for reference. Toddlers are supposed to be about 10 uh, less than 10% of their diet to be sugar. So if that's a reference for parents and grandparents, that might be like helpful to remember, but really I like to harp on more of, and my whole philosophy is kind of crowding out So kind of trying to crowd out those unhealthy sugars the best you can. And the way that I've seen it work best and I've read it works best is actually through an environmental change when we're eating. So what I mean by that is the best sort of environment that you can set up for your kids for a healthy diet is going to be the, was going to be your best bet for this to work. So what you do as a parent, first off, as I said, everything's a mirror. So step one is you. (laughs) check your diet, check to make sure that you're fueling yourself with the best food that you can and making sure that you are eating the, like at the right times and kind of making sure that you're talking about food in the right way. And that's can be like step one. Step two is to really create this like family connection. A lot of studies have come out that most children will eat better foods for themselves when it is a family setting. I know previously we've talked about how dinner time is like such an important part of a family dynamic. And I think what they used to do in the past is, you know, everyone comes around the table. It's like, there's no technology because it didn't exist. And everyone <laughs> is sitting there and talking and laughing and really taking the time to give thanks for the food that's in front of them. And by that relaxation, your body's actually going to absorb the nutrients much better. So what I try and encourage parents to do or grandparents and caregivers is to create that environment. It's kind of like going back old school, like yes, everyone, so <laughs> everyone go back to the face. table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everyone back on the table, phones away, TV off, and really just kind of enjoy each other's company and give thanks for the food that's in front of you, because that will be the best bet for your kid to actually understand the value of food, understand what food can bring because it is a connection. Like we're social beings. That's where food comes in. Right. Uh, and the, as I said, the more relaxed you are in a food setting, and this is for anyone out there, this happens, not just kids, like any adult, the more relaxed you are eating, the better you're going to absorb your nutrition. So if, you know, you are creating an environment where it's relaxing and everyone is happy and having fun, your kid and yourself are going to actually absorb those nutrients that, that you want them to, and like the nutrients that you're putting on the table. Mm-hmm. And I know the hardest part during caregiver meals is the no part of caregiver meals. <laughs> like, I know I don't want that. No, that's yucky. I don't like that or whatever it is. And I get that it is such a natural part of your brain. Similar to sugar, there is like an innate part of your brain, the reason why it happens. And it's because the when we were, you know, cavemen, anytime that you didn't know what it was, you would say no, because you thought it would harm you. So part of our brain still hasn't really developed since then. So we still innately would be like, no, I don't want that because you think that you're scared of it, or it might be harm to you. So the best thing that you can kind of do as a caregiver is, again, set that table. When you are making the meal, I would put it into different parts. So like break everything up as simple as you can. And kind of offer the food to the child as what would you like here? These are all your options. Why don't you help me build you a plate by giving them a little bit of agency? They might be more willing to try something new. It's always important though, to have like some food on the table that you know that they absolutely will eat for one of my clients. It's like brown rice is a huge thing for their kid. Or sometimes it's like a, a pancake or an egg that I know it's not normally dinner time food, but it is a good 
source of protein. So sometimes that could be something good for you to have across the table and kind of let them choose, pick and choose what kind they want, how much they want of it. And if they say no, that's okay. It's kind of releasing the hardest part is the caregiver saying it's okay for them to say no. It's just okay. And remove that pressure because once you remove it, the kid is most likely going to actually eat the food that you are intending them to. I just love that because it's reverse psychology. Mm -hmm. You think about it, because I remember sitting at the table when I was young. By the way, family dinners when I was young was so special. You sat down as a family. Everyone talked. My mom cooked a fresh meal every single night. But the thing about my mom was she always would put a vegetable. There was always a vegetable salad and a protein. And some of the vegetables, especially as a child, I didn't like them. And I was forced to mm -hmm. eat. And by telling your child, okay, if you don't want that, that's fine. But you still have to sit here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that has to be part of the negotiation is that you still stay at the table, but you don't have to eat it. And you had said that a lot of times they will start picking and begin eating when you take that pressure off of them and you give them the opportunity to decide if they want to eat or not. And I love that. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's so important to kind of remove that pressure because as you said, you're now associating whatever vegetable it is with a negative association, yeah. which is super common for kids. So the more you force it, the worse that kid is actually going to behave at the dinner table. And actually like, later in life, they're going to probably end up hating that vegetable for a very long time, which is common because it's such a powerful association when it's, especially when it's negative and especially when it's pretty forced on you. Yeah. I, yeah. I totally see that. And just to take the responsibility and put it on them and say, if you don't want to, you don't have to yeah. eat anything that's on the table, but you need to stay while we're eating and be a part of the family. I mean, that's pretty much what you would say. And I think yeah. that's really great. So, and sorry, one more second. Um, yes. The other thing I would add on to that is just for like a point of reference, there's a ton of research out there that it takes like a hundred or more times for a kid to actually try a food. So that no might not be a no forever. It just might be a no for right now. And eventually the hope is that the more you offer it, the more that you talk about it as a, as an adult, like I like this food. This is, it tastes crunchy. It it's a little bit sweet. The kid might then get a little bit more interested into trying that food. So a hundred times you might get a no, but on the hundred and first time you might get that. Yes. So just keep, keep offering. Lucky. Yeah. So what about labeling food as good or bad? Like I said earlier, children are bombarded with commercials and social media. How do you find that balance and the labeling? Because we don't want to label food. This is good for you, but this is bad for you. Where's the balance with that? Yeah, honestly, it's, Something that I consistently check myself and try and unlearn because it is something that's been so ingrained, I mm -hmm. think, for generations and especially someone in the healthcare field like us, like health coaches, like we know what it does to your body, you know, the science behind it. So it's so hard, I think, to remove that filter. And it is something that, I mean, I, I actively do it every day. And the reason that I do is essentially if you associate good and bad to food, it creates an, a biased um, formulation in, in a kid's brain or even in anyone's brain. Like if I tell you that, let's, for example, you're drinking, I don't know, a seltzer water. I'm like, oh, that's bad for you. You might then rethink like, oh, is this bad for me? And then it kind of like makes you feel a little bit standoffish and a little guarded. And then if multiple people say that to you, you might then start to think, it is bad for you, even though really it might not actually be that bad for you. It's just, <laughs> it's group thing. So it's, um, it's something that I always try and teach parents is if you remove those labels and just call food for what it is, yes. your kid can then associate with the food based upon how they feel. So a lot of the work that I do is with adults is to tune into your body and to kind of like relearn what your body is telling you, relearn how your body is working. So for instance, a brownie in my house is just a brownie. A, a carrot is just a carrot. 
However, I know that a brownie sometimes doesn't make me feel so good four hours later. Mm -hmm. And so, but in certain situations, because of the environment, it might feel good to have a brownie with amongst friends and that's okay. And that that's just a brownie. There's no guilt behind it. Cause once you associate guilt, you're then associating an emotional connection to it, which then is could carry through adulthood, which is why we see a lot of people that say, I had a bad day. Now I'm going to eat ice cream to make me feel better. Or, you know, I have to run seven miles because I ate two desserts last night. And you're creating this so negative connotation to certain food when reality, it's just food. It's just ingredients that makes up some sort of energy for your body. So it's always important to, to kind of remind yourself and remind your family members of it's not the food that's bad and it's not the food that's good. It's just what that food is doing to you and your body. So if it feels good to you, that's okay. If it feels bad for your body, that's when you want to change and you want to substitute with something good. And obviously the reason why labeling or taking away labels is okay is that naturally we are meant to eat whole foods. We're meant to eat foods that are unprocessed or the most unprocessed version that we can get. So if you teach yourself and teach your family to tune in, you'll naturally eat more whole foods that are unprocessed because that's when you'll feel your best. Right. So do you think that focusing on good and bad and talking about food in that way could that possibly be a trigger for an eating disorder later on down the road? Yeah, I mean, it certainly can. I think it, it kind of is all encompassing. It kind of talks about the mirroring that we talked about a little bit before and good and bad, because I think when you put them two together, and let's go back to the example that I said around when I was growing up, there was a lot of society saying, you know, a certain a thin weight was the best. Now mm-hmm. you can get a thin weight, by not eating, you can get a thin weight by eating garbage just and throwing it up or, you know, or just kind of not eating enough of it. So you're still calorie deficient for your body, but you're still thin. Mm -hmm. So I think the challenge is when you put it all together, you're kind of creating this overanalyzation. And I think that's the part that it can be really damaging is that you're overanalyzing every action that you're doing. You're overanalyzing every food that you're doing. You're overthinking which is increasing your cortisol, which is increasing your stress. And you're kind of rolling down this rabbit hill of just trying to get control of something, which is sometimes, again, every eating disorder and every, every situation can be very different and the triggers can be very different, but you do have a possibility of kind of running around this rabbit hole of being hyperly focused on your weight, hyperly focused on the food, which then can kind of make you feel overwhelmed, which is sometimes what studies have seen can be linked to wanting control, which could be linked to an eating disorder. So again, not always the same linear path and not always the same reasons, but it is, it is something that I really teach. And I really try whenever I talk to anyone, especially people with young kids is to not think so much and the general rule is if it came from the earth or it came, it might come from the earth, you might've processed it a little bit, or it's, it's, it's as close to the earth as possible. Generally, it'll make you feel good. Yeah. And generally you will then perform better and the amount of it should not matter. Okay. What are the ramifications of the reward system when it comes to food? Oh boy, the reward system. <laughs> uh, so uh, a reward, creating a reward or like calling something a reward actually changes your brain a bit. It creates a dopamine high. So your body is actually like very excited and, it, and it's now happy. It's like the happy hormone. So the problem that re- why rewards don't work. So a reward would be like sit at the dinner table. And if you sit at the dinner table, I'm going to give you... Um, you know, chocolate, like I'm, I'm talking specifically around food rewards or like try and go to the bathroom and we'll give you a peanut, uh, M&M. That's like a big potty training thing that I've seen on the internet. We're like, <laughs> if you sit on the toilet, I'll give you an M&M, <laughs> which, uh, anyways, <laughs> um, the problem with reward systems, to be honest around food is it, again, it kind of creates this like negative emotional attachment towards foods and can also translate to picky eating. So those are the kind of two big things. 
Um, if you create a reward system, someone might then feel like, you know, you have to have this like trade-off. It's continuously like bringing this like trade-off to uh, your food. It's creating like a hierarchy in the sense of, okay, like it, it can kind of tie back to like what we talked about before is like, if I run seven miles, then I get this reward of, of eating a brownie. Like if you're thinking about it that way, your, your brain is associating kind of a dopamine high only when you're eating the brownie, like the running didn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Um, or it's like, it could, cause it's like emotional eating. So there's another part of that, like layer that you kind of need to peel back and talk about, well, why do you have an emotion based upon running? Like is what, what's going on there? Mm -hmm. Um, and feeling like you need, you need that at the end, like what's that need coming from? Mm -hmm. And the other problem is picky eating. So like, if you start a reward system as a child or at a young age, and you're kind of rewarding them to, to do something. Yeah. In the moment, it may be like, great, good. I got my kid to eat my vegetables, <laughs> but really, <laughs> really you're creating a negative association with that vegetable, or with that food. And also then kind of complicating the relationship that they have with the food. So you're, you're kind of not in the long run helping what it is that you want to solve in the beginning. Right. And it will just further the picky eaters. I've heard a lot of parents talk about how like, you know, they'll have their kid try and sit down for dinner. It won't go well. And they'll tell the kid, if you sit down for dinner, you can have dessert. And the kid just refuses to eat, refuses to eat, refuses to eat. And eventually parents will give up and reward the kid for dessert. So in their brain as a kid, they're like, okay, if I sit at this dinner table long enough, eventually I'll just get the treat that I want. So I know that rewards are part of trying to do positive reinforcement, which is good, but I would argue that maybe a different type of reward system probably yes. would be better yes. <laughs> than Not food. food. Right. Exactly. Yes. yes. Because that is feeding into a lot of the other in, in, things that we've talked about so yeah. far. And so what I would encourage parents to do is to incentivize connection. So like, okay, so we're going to eat dinner and then we're going to read a book, but we mm -hmm. have to eat dinner first and then we'll read the book or after like lunch, we'll go to the park or something with a positive end to it where it's something the kid would want or another good example is like if once we pick up all the toys then we can do bath time or something like that because like some kids like bath time but anyways you want the action there and to reward it with almost like a connection or something that's going to foster creativity or something that's going to bond you and your kid because that way if it's kind of more of this activity based or more of this connection based you're also not running the risk of which a lot of parents, I guess, have run into problems with of like, if you do this, and then you get a toy. Sometimes while it's not food, you also run the risk of that needing to be bigger and bigger each time. Yeah, I think it should be a reward where you're doing something that is fun for the child mm -hmm. that has a healthy spin on it in some way. Like we'll go to the park for a half hour after dinner or we'll play basketball board. yeah anything Something, anything yes that fosters a positive not that you're going to get an ice cream at the end of it because yeah yeah I love that I I really do it, you know it's really simple psychology in a way but we get caught up I think also as parents of youngsters sometimes we just don't have the patience at the moment and it's easier yeah just to give in and give them what they want or the treat that they want. But in the long run, you're not really doing them any favors. Am I right about yeah. that? Yeah. I mean, patience, it, it is tough. And I think that's, again, it's usually at the wit's end where you're like, I've had a long day. I don't, mm -hmm. I just, I can't do it. Just, just, which is okay. Like, that's the other thing. It's like, my biggest thing is like, it's okay. Like, it happens. It's really it, one time or a couple times will not change the total psychology of your kid. But right. I think when you have the moments that you can, you know, internally regulate yourself. And that's also an important skill to teach a kid is that, you know, I'm feeling overwhelmed. Let me take a couple of deep breaths. Do you want to do it with me? Like kind of also teaching them how mm. to handle some of those like more stressful situations or times where you're feeling overwhelmed, like every, as we said, everything that you're doing will translate to the kid in some way. So it's kind of not being afraid to kind of be a little bit vulnerable, or if you do make a mistake and you say something or do something that you don't necessarily 
or necessarily wanted to going back to the kid, like I was overwhelmed. I'm so sorry. And kind of explaining it to them in that way too, because that does teach sometimes in the heat of the moment, we're all human. We do something that we don't necessarily want. And it's kind of rebuilding the trust or rebuilding what the relationship between them. And of course, depending upon the age, but I think it's just, as you said, super important to remember that this is like the ideal or sometimes like I understand like reality is just reality and it's okay. (laughs) (laughs) Ice cream won't hurt a kid every once in a while. Right. (laughs) Right. But it's good to find the balance between the two because we're not perfect. We never will be perfect. We want to instill healthy habits in our kids without a doubt, but yet we don't want to take the joy of being a child out of the whole. And so they need to be able to realize that when they do get it, it is a treat, but it's not something that you could expect to have all the time, you know, it has to be a special treat. I think it's almost like changing your language, like instead of calling it a like almost. So if you had in your in your brain, like, oh, I maybe, you know, I'm going to go get ice cream after dinner, maybe not tell them and just and just kind of nonchalantly, as I said, like kind of like call food food. Oh, I'm feeling like I want an ice cream. Do you want ice cream? I would love to get ice cream with you. Would you want to kind of taking away even like as simple as like. After the park, um, like there's no reward of going to go get ice cream, but just kind of like, let's go get ice cream and making it very like a typical conversation. It's kind of to go back to what we were talking about with food uh, and the dinner table. There is some research out there that actually shows that if you put the food with a treat or, or with that brownie or with something that might not be as healthy for them yeah. and you kind of just put them all together, the kid will most likely eat the brownie first, but then will also most likely eat the rest of their food because they don't see an association oh. between them. So the oh. more like unassociated you make it, kind yeah. of the better off that the kid will be to actually consume that the food that you want to. Right. And it's teaching. It's like I I always say all the time whenever I'm around a kid, I'm like, oh, like I like like I, I don't know what an example would be, um, carrots or something. So like, like, I love these carrots. They're super crunchy and they make me feel good. And I feel like I have a ton of energy afterwards. And then they'll be like, what is that? And kind of get them more curious about it. Be like, yeah. talk, like, it sounds so silly to talk about it that way, but truly it is. Or, you know, I ate ice cream yesterday and my stomach isn't feeling too good right now, but that's okay. I just, I need to like not eat ice cream tonight because it's still kind of hurting from yesterday. Like kind of talking about some of these like feelings and associating again, back to your body, kind of like in tuning in, doing intuitive eating of like, this feels good. This didn't feel good. And kind of explaining why. And sometimes that can help a kid recognize like, you know, I liked this. I didn't like that. Or I'm full. That's a big thing. Like kind of feeling like your belly full you're done. Like, it's okay. (laughs) Right. It's it's psychology. I mean, simple simple psychology, I feel like, because you put it into proper perspective, you know, you're taking the emotion out of it and you're just looking at it for what it really is all about. And it's just simple psychology. Truly simple, but complex. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) Talk about the Clean Plate Club. What is that all about? Yeah, the Clean Plate Club. My gosh, <laughs> say that. Yeah, I had a hot time. You'll never get it. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never get it. Um, <laughs> uh, to tell everyone what a Clean Plate Club is, because um, I know some people have heard about it. I think Susan, the first time I explained this to you, you're like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> Um, it essentially is this club or a membership where you finish all the food that's on your plate. Usually in most households where this is an institution or where like they encourage you to be a member of the clean plate club is when a parent or a caregiver has plate plated the food for a child, given it to them and said, okay, now you have to eat all of your food to be a member and you can't leave until you've, you've become a member and we're done with dinner. Um, so what that incentivizes then is a child needing to, A, they might not be that hungry. B, they might not love all the food that you plated them. 
and see, it kind of like takes away all agency from them. And it's a more of like a forceful technique to get them to eat the proper nutrients. And I understand why parents do it. I mean, I think a lot of parents, as you said, kind of mealtime is the hard, one of the hardest parts around small children. It's also really challenging to feel like, or it's a very anxious feeling of like, did my kid get enough nutrients today? Have they eaten enough today? So there's a lot of concern around the type of food, the amount of food and all that kind of things when it comes to a kid. So I understand the idea behind it, but the problem is, is that it causes, again, so much emotional eating towards what you are doing. You know, a lot of clients that I've talked to about this, you know, I have a, one that comes to mind is she, Brussels sprouts were part of her clean plate club. So her mom would make Brussels sprouts, put it on her plate and say, now you have to eat everything that's on your plate before you leave. So she wasn't hungry very often for those types of foods, but it's there. She got a big portion of it because she had no agency in how much she wanted. She had to try it. She had to finish it. So to this day, being an adult, she can say like, oh, I hate Brussels sprouts. And because you go back to that, like <laughs> that mm-hmm. exact moment where your child sitting there and t- someone saying you have to do this before you get to leave. So very strict with, with rules in that kind of way. So they would not give in. And it's just kind of like part of the meal and you have to do it. And so it's a lot of work that I do with clients to kind of say, okay, well, maybe Brussels sprouts might not be over. It's your favorite thing, even as an adult, but what is the emotion behind that? Why is Brussels sprouts so triggering for me to suggest that you add to your diet? And it's because they had this negative association. So kind of trying to just like separate between with work of between the food itself and the emotion attached to it. If you can separate them, it might be that you like Brussels sprouts and you just never knew it because it's so emotionally triggering to you because of your experience as a kid. Do you think this is a good tool, this clean plate club? No, no, <laughs> no. As no I, said, I, don't I, I honestly, not at all. Cause I think again, it, it, it does, it hits everything that I don't necessarily agree with on mealtime. It is about connection, which is fine. You have to sit at the table However, it takes away an agency, like a kid should be able to pick amongst the table what it is that they want from the table. I think with kids getting served every two to three hours, you do have a good chance as a parent to kind of introduce healthy food options that are nutritionally balanced for a kid. So if if that night they just want the, I don't know, the carrots, that's okay. Or just the corn, like, okay, that's okay. If they're hungry in two hours or they seem hungry, you can name it for them. Say like, oh, you're looking hungry. You're like, your mood has changed. My mood changes too. Do you want to go get some food? And you can reintroduce another sort of snack okay. or another sort of like healthy option for them. So it kind of takes away that big part of a child, which is like when they're first developing their no, they're first developing their ego and all like answer to things that they even like love is a no because they now feel the power to do so. So <laughs> it's taking away so much of that and it will cause such a feel of loss of control which as adults i think most of us have like learned to self-regulate if there's something that doesn't go our way but as a kid that's usually translates into some sort of like tantrum yeah so kind of like trying to provide some sort of agency and let them pick some of the stuff they want let them pick the amount is really helpful for them to want to try new foods and to be open to that uh, the other reason why I don't like it is it doesn't tune into that whole intuitive eating that we talked about of like, I'm hungry or I'm full because mm-hmm. a lot of time, if you like parents naturally need more food and energy than kids, we just have, we're, we're larger bodies. <laughs> we have, we consume right. more energy, right. whereas a kid might not need that much, but if you're serving the same amount or if you're over serving them and telling them they have to finish it, yeah. you could cause overweight, you could cause, you know, overnutrition and also you're kind of taking away that concept of like, I'm full or I'm hungry, which is super hard, I think, to get back in a way. So it's kind of like you're setting kids up to overeat in the future if you don't let them kind of tell you like, I'm full or if they have to finish everything. Yeah. As a parent, I could think about this back when my daughter was a baby. I would prefer to see her eat or taste everything that was on her plate she doesn't necessarily have to finish because like you said everyone is different she may not be really hungry right now but giving her 
the opportunity to try everything on the plate, I think is a great idea. And then, okay, you know, whenever you're done, you're done. They did have something. And I think if you also say, you don't have to eat anymore, but I would prefer that you sit at the table and continue to talk until we're all done, they may start picking again at it. Just reverse yeah. technology again. Yeah, it truly is. And the other the other thing I know, because um, you know, asking a kid what they want or asking a kid like what they would like to eat can also be a really daunting thing for a caregiver because you know, if you are kind of putting a ton of agency on the kid, you're also then losing boundaries as a parent or as that caregiver. So another thing that I like to teach parents is like, you know if you are struggling and they're like, Hey, I don't want, you know, X carrot. You say, okay, that's all right. You don't have to eat it. But they say like, eh, but you say, what else do you want on the table? And they say, I want the like, mac and cheese that has nothing to do with the table. You go, okay, well, mac and cheese is on the menu tonight. We can look into bringing it in tomorrow. This is what we have tonight. And kind of creating that boundary with a kid, because that also is really important. But the flip side is if you do make a promise, you got to keep it. Yes. That's or else the kid will not listen to you afterwards. Right. It's but, mac and cheese tomorrow. We got yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Regardless. But it is an incentive to try and get them to try something else on the yeah. table. Um, because if not, they might like, you don't want to give total agency, but you want to give them enough for their age or for enough for them to at least be a participant. Yes. And be able to make a choice and allow yeah. you to make. Yeah, or like talk about the food. I think that's the most interesting thing that you can do with a kid is like, do you, what what does the flavor look like to you? Do you feel like it tastes, like as I said, like crunchy, like like a, kind of like this, the sensitivities, like is it crunchy? Does it feel soft? I'm trying to think of other things that I've used in the past. Is it slippery like soup or something like or does it feel like water like is it liquidy like you can kind of like play around with like different adjectives and different ways to describe the fruit yeah. and also like it might encourage them like oh this is crunchy do you want to taste it can you tell me do you think it's crunchy like kind of get them like almost like a game yeah everything kind of like gamify it a little bit yeah. and get them a little bit interested in it can help them try and want like pick it up and try it try it with you I love that Erica give me a final thought. My final thought is if you as a parent or a caregiver can kind of create the best environment to have a successful interaction with food, that is kind of all you really can do without seeking further guidance. And so if you create this family dynamic, if you create this safe environment with the foods and have a food that they definitely like and kind of talk about the foods and kind of make it more interactive, um, you know, and watch the way that you speak about stuff off the plate and kind of watch and kind of try and be the best version of you off the plate. You're most likely going to have a kid that will at least eat something on the table. Right. And I feel like giving them the option to say, okay, if yeah. you're not hungry, this is what we're having. That's okay. But you or need get them have... involved in the kitchen. That's another cool tool. Like yes. have them mix things, have them get involved. Cause yes. the more, the more you bring them into the whole experience and you make it an experience, yes. the more likely the kid or the child will, will come along with you during it. So Excellent. Like, yeah, like if you, uh, like I love making like pancakes with my niece and we're like, in there and she's mixing it and we're talking about the eggs and we're talking about everything that we're putting into it and why we put into it and kind of she doesn't really understand all of it but it is something that like the more you talk about and the more you're vocal about what it is and why you're eating it and how it makes you feel good and the different components of it then it's kind of exciting when she like she's like oh like do you want to make it into a shape like <laughs> anything I'm like anything to get you to more excited about this entire yeah. event is what I will do. So that way the success of you trying it is that much higher. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Erica. Yeah, I'm so, so happy. I believe that this episode is going to be eye-opening for a lot of parents and grandparents. And, you know, like I said earlier, I know from my own experience, a lot of my friends who are newly 
of parents, they're watching their grandchildren on yeah. a five day a week schedule. And so they are really setting the tone. And because this podcast is really for uh, mature women, I feel that this is a perfect episode. It's not about their health, but it's about the health of their grandchildren and how to raise them or help raise them to have a healthy relationship with food. I live near a high school and mm -hmm. when high school lets out during the day, if I'm by the school, I just happen to notice that so many of the kids are overweight. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of overweight children. And at a young age, it's not so terrible. But if this progresses into adulthood, they're looking at facing a lot of health challenges down the road. So yeah. I think it's so important as early as you can to instill a healthy relationship with food and not really label foods as good or bad, but just to let children know that this food is really good for your body. This food mm -hmm. is going to give you more energy. It's going to help you think, and you could put it on their level, how it would enhance their performance. You'll play baseball better, or, or you'll be better in gymnastics. And just putting a positive spin on food and trying to stay away from all of the commercials that are on television with all this processed foods that yeah. are just yeah, it's healthy. It is super challenging. Yeah. And I don't, I think it's hard for adults as well as it is for children. I think it's overwhelming sometimes with the amount of food and the labels and everything that you have to kind of like think about when you are shopping for food and trying to like nourish your family. But yeah, I think, as you kind of said, it's the earlier that you can kind of instill a healthy habit, it's the best thing that you can do. And that starts with the caregiver. It starts yes. with the people that they are kind of interacting with. And so I think that's kind of an interesting spin on it is that if you are doing it one way and trying to instill a different way for your child, it's never going to work. They're going to call you on it. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's, it's, it's one of those things like embracing it together as an entire family, which is why I tend to say that I work with families while I do work with adults. It is a family thing because anything that you're learning and anything that you are absorbing as an adult or changing the way that you are sort of moving through this life, whether it's like your mental wellness, whether it's your nutrition, whether it's your uh, physical exercise, you're infecting the people that you're closest with evidently always. Excellent final, final thought. Thank you so much. Erica, thank you for being here with us today. I appreciate you coming on. I think you're doing really valuable work um, and you should be really proud of yourself because you're changing children's lives. Really, you are by having them have a healthy relationship with food. Ultimately, they'll hopefully live healthy lives for many years to come. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that very much. And if anyone here who's listening, if you'd like to share it with anyone who you know and love, who may be struggling with a child who has difficulty with eating in some way, either they're very picky eaters or they just don't want to sit down at the table to do it, please share this episode out with them and maybe we could offer some tips and tools. And I will put Erica's information so you can contact her if you like and talk to her further. And until the next time, I just want to say be well, stay happy, and bye for now. Take good care. Thank you so 